Good morning, everybody. So does anyone have any sense of how many years a company that's in the S&P 500 today uh, will be likely to last, average lifespan? Anyone? 50? No, no, no. It's actually 15 years. And that's compared to 57 in the 1920s. So it's tough to survive that long, right? Today's speaker, Jen Say, is going to talk about a brand and a company that's been around for almost 150 years. So Jen is the CMO of Levi Strauss. She's a key insights partner for me and for my team. She's very fact-based, consumer-oriented. She's always driving for results, sets a high bar for her team as well as for my team. Jen's got a long history of accomplishments. So in what year, Gwen? 1986, all right. Gymnastics fans, she was the US national champion for women's gymnastics, yay! She then went on to Stanford University. She is also a best-selling author. She was named one of the 40 under 40 by Advertising Age. She also it was named one of the top 50 women in retail. And most recently, my favorite accolade is Jen was named one of the 25 most powerful people in music by Billboard magazine. So also I really appreciate Jen coming out here, uh, flying out from San Francisco, which is where we're located. She just came back from maternity leave, having had her fourth child. So please welcome Jen. Baby, you're a Thank you, Barb. That was really nice. Um, as Barb mentioned, I did just come back from maternity leave. I have a, uh, my three-month-old daughter um, is here with me, and I hope you'll excuse me if I'm not as clear-headed and articulate as I normally like to be, but I haven't slept in quite a few months. So. <laughs> and she's here in the other room, not by herself. She's with a friend of mine. <laughs> anyway, um, and I do have three older children, so a lot going on in my house at the moment. Um, but my daughter's name is Ruth, and I was, I was thinking recently about what I was asked to come here to do, um, talk about how you build a brand that lasts, and I was thinking about my daughter, because all these things come together, and her name is Ruth, which is an unusual name for a baby these days, and most people that I tell, they say, oh, what's your baby's name? And I say, her name is Ruth, and they, they all have a story. My favorite aunt, the story all starts, always starts the same way. My favorite aunt was named Ruth, usually my favorite great aunt, because it's a name from uh, you know, two generations ago. My favorite great aunt, her name was Ruth. Let me tell you about my Aunt Ruthie. Even our CEO, Chip Berg, had a story about his favorite aunt, Aunt Ruthie. Um, and so it's interesting because everybody wants to tell a story about their Aunt Ruth. And it's not that different than the experience of working um, for Levi's. And I'm sure Barb can, can, um, can share the same sort of point of view. Anyone you tell that you work for Levi's, and I've been working for Levi's for almost 18 years. Anyone you tell, your Uber driver, your taxi driver, the customs agent, they all say, oh, I have a story about Levi's. Everyone has a story. It's usually a story from when they were young. Um, they want to tell you about the road trip they took after college or the concert they went to. Um, they went to Woodstock. They went to Coachella. I'm spanning the generations here. But you understand my point. Everyone has a story about Levi's. Um, and that is how you build a brand that lasts. You tell stories about your brand that have meaning and resonance, and you create the conditions for people to tell stories, to have life experiences. Um, data, insights, I'm not going to talk a ton about that today. You'll see it guides us in what we do. Um, but really what I'm going to talk about is the art of storytelling. We have been telling stories at Levi's for over 143 years, and we've been giving people reasons to tell stories about our brand. I came across a quote from Scott, and I have to read this because my memory is poor at the moment. I have baby brain, which I'm sure you'll excuse. Um, but I'm going to read this quote from Scott. Um, if you want to figure out why things sell, you can't just look at media placement and multi-touch attribution. You really need to think a lot about the other side of the brain, where the artistic side 
demonstrates or creates yearning and identification. So that's what we're going to talk about today. How do you create yearning? And you don't, you don't do that <laughs> through attribution modeling. So we think a lot about the art side, and we leverage insights to do that. Um, they guide us. They inform us. They don't tell us the answer. They never tell us the whole answer. Um, because what we're out to do is create something far more emotional. Um, so with that, as I said, we've been telling stories um, since about 1873, so over 143 years. Um, and I'm going to go fast forward a little bit to 1985 and show you um, a story um, that sort of took hold in 1985 in Europe. This was an ad we ran back, back then. was called Laundrette, and it ran um, in Europe. It never ran in the United States um, in the mid-'80s. It launched the career of that guy, who you probably don't know, because I don't think his fame went beyond Europe, but his name is Nick Kamen, and he was a model and a pop star um, in Europe in the 80s and 90s. It also launched um, the 501 in pre-shrunk. Now all the jeans we wear are pre-shrunk, but at the time they weren't. You had to sit in the bathtub. I'm sure you guys have seen that and shrink them to your size. This made the jeans buying process much simpler. Now we could have run an ad that talked about the features and benefits of pre-washed denim, but I don't think that would have been quite as compelling. Instead, we chose a different route, which was storytelling with a cute guy, sexy story, great music, and ultimately that was far more memorable um, than just talking about the features and benefits of the 501. We would not be showing, I would not be showing this ad 30 years later, more than 30 years later, if I just had talk, if we had just talked about the features and benefits. Um, so storytelling is in our DNA, and this, this ad and, and, and a couple uh, of others from around the same time frame set up this notion of narrative storytelling for us as a brand. Storytelling is really in our DNA. Um, and stories really are at the heart of the human experience. And if you'll indulge me for a second, I'm going to quote a few writers. I like books. I, did, I, I wrote a book. I, I, I like uh, literary figures. Um, but this is a great quote, I think, by Ursula Le Guin, the American science fiction writer. There have been great societies that did not use the wheel, but there have been no societies that did not tell stories. Another quote from Philip Pullman, who wrote The Golden Compass, which you must read if you haven't. After nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the thing we need, we, we need most in the world. Stories, that's how we share information in a memorable way. And that's what we seek to do with the stories that we tell. And you'll see as I talk that we also seek to create the conditions where people have their own Levi's stories to tell. And that's what carries us through the generations. We are a brand that was born, the company was born in 1853. The brand Levi's was born in 1873. Uh, we were born in San Francisco for those pioneers who traveled west to create a better life for themselves and their families. We were created in California, and we are authentically American, and these are the stories that we tell. They are stories of hope and progress and inclusion and democracy and connection. Those are the stories that make the Levi's brand what it is. We are the best and most loved jeans brand in the world. We know this for a fact. We know this because we have insights. We have data that tells us this. The challenge is how do we stay this? That's less easy to know. It's hard to know how to do this. You know, as Barb said, most brands don't make it in the top for more than about 15 years. And here we are, the number one jeans brand in the world. It would have been easy to go the way of the dinosaur a long time ago. But we are still 
and have been for many decades the best and most loved jeans brand in the world. This is harder today now than it ever was. There's more competition. How do we do this? By creating more fans, by telling more stories. Every great love story, uh, every great love starts with a story. That's another literary quote. Well, it's Nicholas Sparks. I'm not sure that qualifies as literary, but a writer nonetheless. Every great love starts with a great story, and most people have a story to tell about Levi's. We are the youngest, oldest brand in the world. This is a quote that sort of passes through our hallowed halls. I don't totally know who said it, um, but I love it. Um, and the reason I love it is I like this idea because most of us, we tell stories about being young. The stories I hear about Levi's are usually stories of being young. Um, they are stories, as I said, about that college road trip um, all I took was my backpack and a pair of Levi's. I met my wife. Um, I was wearing my favorite 501s. I went to Woodstock. I went to, these are the stories people tell about Levi's. In fact, I met a woman just the other day who told me, I have a pair of 501s in my drawer I, from college. I try them on once a year, and that's how I know if I'm still in fighting form. That's how I know I've stayed fit. I don't get on a scale. I don't weigh myself. I don't like the numbers, but if the 501s fit, then I know I'm in good shape. That's a Levi's story. Everyone has one. I'm telling you, every single person I meet has a Levi's story. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, we're at our best when we're at the center of things, at the center of culture. I think when we have erred and sort of gone astray, it's when we stray too far to the edge of culture. We are a brand that can live, I'll quote our president, James Curley, um, we, should, we, we can live at the coffee house and the stadium. We need to do both. We need to be at the center of things, but we need to also be at the forefront of things. When we're at the center of youth culture, when we're at the center of culture, when we're at the center of the story, this is a brand that thrives. Last year, I had the opportunity to go to London. Um, the Victorian Albert, if you haven't been to this museum, you must go. It's quite lovely. The V&A Museum um, did an exhibit called Records and Rebels. And it was about the counterculture movement in the late 60s and the early 70s, primarily centered in New York, San Francisco, and London. Levi's was featured prominently. There were five pairs of Levi's featured in the exhibit because Levi's were the uniform of this counterculture movement, the uniform of progress. Um, and so we were featured so prominently. They had called us originally. They wanted to show one item. But they came to visit our archives, and they fell in love with so many pieces um, that they ended up featuring five, and we ended up uh, sponsoring the exhibit. So that is an example that is illustrative of the fact that we were at the center of culture then. We really dressed that entire movement, not through publicity, because they chose Levi's, because Levi's is all about authenticity and self-expression, and that's what these people were about. And once again, however many years later, I'm not going to do the math on that, 30, 40 years later, we were at the center of culture again by being featured so prominently in the V&A exhibit, exhibit. We were at the center of many moments, cultural moments, last year, and we will be again this year. Last year, the Super Bowl was at Levi's Stadium, center of culture moment number one. Um, we showed up at Coachella, arguably center of culture moment, um, in a really big way. And people were either wearing Levi's or they were wearing nothing at Coachella. That's the way it goes at Coachella. And just last week, I just got back from Austin. We were at South by Southwest, and we were featured very prominently. We announced two partnerships, one with Rolling Stone and one with Google, once again, at the center of culture. How do you stay there? That's the key, more stories. We are an American icon. We have stories that span the generations. Your grandfather has stories and your children have stories. We have over 140 years of stories under our belt and we're aiming to create 140 more. And those stories are wide ranging. They span generations um, from the rebels in the 50s, uh, the punks, in the 70s, the cowboys, if you go way back, um, to the, the rock and roll icons and heroes of today, everyone from Bruce Springsteen to Alicia Keys to Snoop Dogg, they all wear Levi's and they all have stories and we're trying to collect them all and we wanna, we wanna show them only to encourage more storytelling. We are lucky in that the genes themselves tell stories. We have a very robust archives. We're lucky to have this at Levi's. Not a lot of companies have this. Well, not a lot of companies have the history that would suggest necessitate the need for an archive, but we do. 
And if you ever come to San Francisco, you should call me or you should call Barb and you should check it out because it really is remarkable. Um, and for us, the archives inform as much of what we do as data and insights. We constantly go back to the archives. We have genes from the 1880s that we've pulled from mines. There are people that can look at the genes and know from every mark, every whisker, every stain, what the person did in those genes. So it's really, truly incredible. The genes themselves tell stories. They bear the markings of life and the shape of adventure, the shape of the body. Um, and so as a brand, the product leads us to stories, which is a really remarkable gift to have. We are the embodiment of the energy and the events of our time. This is a quote that I do know who to attribute it to. It's Bob Haas, a direct descendant of Levi, <coughs> excuse me, of Levi Strauss himself. And our stories are relevant because they are about the times that we live in. Um, the exhibit, Records and Rebels, that I talked about um, demonstrates that, um, as do the stories that come back from Coachella um, and the stories that come back from South by Southwest. I have my own personal story that I will share with you about Levi's. Um, Barb alluded to the fact or, or, or told you that I was a gymnast. I was a very serious gymnast um, for my entire childhood. Um, I moved away from home when I was 13 to train. I was on the national team for about eight years. Um, in 1986, and I'm in that picture, I'll let you figure out which one I am, the group shot. In 1986, I traveled to Moscow, so this is before the wall came down, for the very first Goodwill Games. And the Goodwill Games was created, if you don't know, by Ted Turner as a response to all the boycotts. Because if you recall, we boycotted the Olympics in the United States in 1980. Um, and then again in 1984, the Olympics were in Los Angeles, but Russia boycotted those Olympics. So, Ted Turner felt like, you know what, the Olympics is an opportunity for athletes to come together, that politics should not play a role. He created this thing called the Goodwill Games. So I was on the team um, at the first Goodwill Games, and that's us in front of um, St. Basil's. Um, and I was told when I went, I was very excited to get to go. I mean, that's an amazing thing. I'm 16 years old. I get to travel to Moscow, and I was told, bring Levi's. That's what you need to bring. So I went to Macy's with my mom, and I bought 10 pairs of 501s in a variety of very small sizes, because gymnasts are very small. <laughs> and I brought about 10 pairs with me, and I traded them for leotards and for track suits. They weren't called that then, but sweatsuits, um, and pins from the Russian gymnasts. And that's what I wanted. They got a piece of Americana. That's what Levi stood for. Americana, democracy, freedom, all of these things um, that, that Russia at the time <laughs> did not enjoy, um, and arguably now, but that I'll leave that out. <laughs> um, I, they got a piece of that, Levi's, and I got a piece of gymnastics greatness because the Russians were utterly dominant in the sport at that point in time for many, many decades, and all I wanted was, was a piece of that. So that, that's my Levi's story that I like to tell. I obviously have many more now, having worked at the company for so long, um, but that, I think, is a pretty... Um, Pretty cool Levi's story. We get letters. I get letters personally almost every single day. These are just two examples of the kinds of letters I get. Um, one is from a man who's been wearing Levi's for 50 years. He's been wearing 501s for over 50 years. He's actually writing because he had a product issue. Um, so we, we, of course, got him um, new 501s as quickly as possible. Um, I got a letter just the other day from a 13-year-old girl who told me she gets bullied at school, and she sent me a picture of herself in her favorite Levi's shorts and Levi's shirt, and she says, this is what I'm gonna wear um, on my first day of school because I feel confident when I wear this, so I don't care what the bullies do, and you should make an ad about bullying. So you can see that the stories write themselves. Um, Here's some quotes that have informed, this is through qualitative research that we did to inform the platform that we advertise off of now. With my Levi's, I can be myself without compromise. I don't try to be someone that I'm not. That's from a woman in Paris. Assumedly, it started in French and we translated it. Um, this is from a young man in Chicago. Levi's were with me many of my first time experiences. They traveled with me, drank with me, danced with me, cheered with me. Um, if that's not the definition of a true friend, I don't know what is. Um, so that's a young man in Chicago. The prior quote was a young woman 
in Paris, we have similar quotes from people in Shanghai, um, everywhere, all over the world. From Shanghai to Chicago, people tell us stories about the life experiences they had in their Levi's, which led us to this idea that you wear other jeans, you wear other things, but you live your life in Levi's, which is a really powerful place for a brand to exist because you then get ex associated with all of those amazing life experiences that the consumers have. And that is why people love this brand so much. The love people feel for Levi's, it's, it's, it can't really be measured. And like I said, it's a gift to be in my role as the CMO and just simply have the opportunity to amplify that love and tell those stories. Our mission is to capture and tell these stories everywhere and to help fans create new Levi's experiences every day. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. The ad, as we know, plays less and less of a, a role, at least a, a singular role in the marketing mix these days, right? I, I mentioned Coachella. I mentioned Levi's Stadium. I talked about South by Southwest. Um, these things are experiences that people have in Levi's. So while the ad is very important and certainly drives a ton of reach for us, and Believe me, we put a lot of time, attention, energy into researching those ads. It is a small piece of the mix now. Um, but it is illustrative of the types of stories that we tell. Our mission, capture and tell stories everywhere. Our platform, our campaign, our tagline, our reason for being <laughs> is live in Levi's. I'm going to show you an ad now that's our current ad. It's just been running for a couple of weeks. Another story. I never stop, no, I don't quit. And when I swing, I don't miss. You ain't never seen nothing like this, yeah. You ain't seen nothing like this. You ain't seen nothing like this. Come on and give me some more. We're gonna shake the floor. I bust down the door. So that just started running. It launched on the Grammys just a few weeks ago. Um, obviously, narrative and structure. Um, the sort of inspiration, the idea that, that birthed the spot was this notion that um, in a world of sort of fakers and inauthentic people, authentic people find each other and authentic people wear Levi's. We don't want Levi's to be the hero necessarily, um, but Levi's are there present in these authentic people's lives. Um, as far as the process to get to a, an ad like that, um, we, do, we do several rounds. We do qualitative script testing. We do quantitative copy testing. Sometimes if we don't get the results that we like, we do another round of quantitative <laughs> copy testing. Um, and that leads us to, to the work. And then we will run something like this for over a year. I mean, the, the, the ad we created in 2015 ran for, ran for two years. Um, when you create something that there is story to, you have the opportunity, I think, for it to be much more lasting because it entertains. Um, when you entertain, when you, when you um, ignite an emotion in people, um, we create a piece of copy that's much more lasting, I think, um, than if we simply did a features and benefits type of an ad. Um, when we talk about product, even the product um, tells a story, as I mentioned. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a product that we introduced two years ago. It's called the 501 CT. Um, C stands for customized, and T stands for tapered. So the 501 is the best-selling gene of all time, the best-selling and most loved gene. Um, I think we did the math once on how many millions, billions um, of 501s have been sold. It's kind of mind-boggling. Um, I believe the 501 is the second biggest jeans brand in the world after Levi's. So 501s have been loved and worn the world over for a very long time. And while we modify them every year, we stay pretty true to the spirit of the 501. But what we had observed um, when we bought up old 501s from vintage shops is that people had been customizing and tapering them, hence the C and the T, themselves. So again, through the genes themselves, we learn more about the user, we learned about the story that is 501, and it enabled us to create a more contemporary version of the 501 called the 501 CT. 
customized and tapered by us, inspired by you, the consumer. The consumer is part of everything that we do. This is a great quote from our head of design, Jonathan Chung. It's, it's almost an entirely crowdsourced style. So again, we were listening through the genes themselves to the stories that people were telling us, and that inspired a whole new style um, to last us another 140 years. Levi's Stadium. People wonder why we did this. I get asked this all the time. Why did you do that? You're not a sports brand. What, we're not a sports brand. Um, we're a jeans brand. And music is really our thing because musicians have been wearing Levi's for generations. Music chose us, I always tell people. We didn't choose music, it chose us. When Bruce Springsteen wore Levi's on the cover of his album in 1984, we didn't have a stylist or a publicity person putting those on him. That's what he showed up in. Um, when Mark Seliger shoots covers for Rolling Stone, he said more than half the people show up in 501s and a white t-shirt. And that's why we're on so many covers of Rolling Stone. Most recently, Taylor Swift last year wore Levi's on the cover. They choose to. So we are a brand that is, we, 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 we talk about self-expression through music. So why the stadium? Because we're also a fan brand. And guess what, if you go to Levi's Stadium, you have a fan experience and you have more stories to tell. I took my son to Levi's Stadium last year to see Beyonce. Before that, I took him to see The Grateful Dead, 50th anniversary Fare Thee Well tour. Talk about variety. We went from The Grateful Dead to Beyonce. But he now has some pretty awesome Levi's stories to tell. He wore his Levi's at Levi's Stadium and he saw two of the most iconic um, acts that you could possibly see. I mean, he's a pretty lucky 13-year-old kid, but that's why. Because we are a fan brand, and we are a fan, a fan brand that is seeking to create more stories, and the stadium allows us to do that. Every game, every concert, there is somewhere between 60 and 80,000 people in attendance that have a unique Levi's experience. It's given us the opportunity to create product that riffs on it, we wouldn't, we're not a sports brand, we're not in the business of making athletic apparel, but as I said, we're a fan brand, and that's why we can do this, and that's why we can extend it to all 32 NFL teams, and into the NBA, and into the Major League uh, Baseball teams as well. Give more fans more stories to tell. That said, I'm gonna show you one last piece of creative um, that we, we ran um, over the course of 15 and 16. As I said, we are a brand that is all about music. That's our sort of language of self-expression. We, we, we always say that our higher purpose, our calling, what it is that we do that is more than what we make is all about authenticity and self-expression. And the language we convey that is through music because as I said, music chose us. So we chose to work with an artist, Alicia Keys, who I'm sure you know, and if you haven't been watching The Voice, she's really awesome on it, so you should watch it. Um, but we chose to work with her um, to launch our newest women's collection back in 2015. And I um, was lucky enough to go to her house and meet her to try to woo her to do this. And what won me over, as if I wasn't won over already, uh, were the stories she told about Levi's. And I will tell you what she told me. She said, we want authentic people that really wear Levi's. I don't want a mercenary relationship. I want people that truly love and understand the brand. And she said, I said, tell me a story about Levi's. And she said, when I was growing up in Harlem, everyone wore Levi's. The skaters, the punks, the b-boys, the hip-hop kids, everyone. They were all connected. Everybody that was exactly who they said they were. Everyone who conveyed true authenticity wore Levi's. They couldn't have been more different in how they expressed themselves, their personal style, and their own brand of authenticity. She was talking about everything from punks to skaters to b-boys, but they all wore Levi's and she wanted Levi's. That's what she remembered from being young. She said, I couldn't afford them, but that's what I wanted. She yearned, there was yearning created because people that were real wore Levi's. And this is just one of the pieces of creative um, that we created with Ms. Keys. All women are naturally badass. All women are so powerful and so incredible and so unique. I find that when I see women that are just comfortable in their skin, whoever that is, however that is, in whatever way that manifests itself, it's beautiful. There's only 28,000 days 
I'm Alicia Keys, and this is how I'm living in Levi's. So that clenched it for us, that she had real Levi's stories. We have longer form creative. I chose to show you the 30 second. We have a piece that's about two minutes um, where she talks at length about the story that I just told you, remembering growing up in Harlem and seeing all these people wearing Levi's. I'll mention one other program um, that we did with Alicia, and then I will, will say my, um, my farewells. Um, as I said, music's important to us. It's important to us also as a company to give back. That's in our DNA. That's in our values. And so Alicia helped us kick off a program, the Levi's Music Project. And we went into a high school called the Edward R. Murrow School in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and we built out a music and technology program. We hired a teacher. We built a recording studio. We put in 30 computers. Um, and we made a commitment for three years. I'm hoping to extend that. We're about halfway through it. Um, and on the day that we launched the program and the kids at the school performed, Alicia came, to, much to their surprise, um, and performed on stage with them. So if you don't think that those kids have an amazing Levi's story to tell at this point, then you are sorely mistaken. I have never been more proud in my life to work for this brand. It was one of the most moving experiences. These kids went absolutely bonkers, and she stayed and talked to every single one. Um, so it just solidified my belief that she was the right one for us and, again, created a really powerful moment for these kids and one that I'm really proud of. Um, so at the end of the day, that's how we do this. Data matters, certainly. Um, Barb is an amazing partner to me and my team in terms of um, giving us those touch points along the way to inform the work that we do. Um, but at the end of the day, you've got to move people. You've got to tell them stories. You have to create more fans. Um, tell more stories, and that becomes this virtuous cycle where then you create more fans. That's it. I'll leave you with that today. I think I'm right on time. Thank you.